Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Thursday Bible Life today. If you'll get your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 9, we'll get started reading in just a few minutes. Uh, we've been going on a journey now from Genesis to eternity, and we went pretty fast through the Old Testament, and when we've come to the New Testament and Jesus' earthly ministry, we've slowed way down, and we're only going to look at a couple or three different events in Jesus' earthly ministry this morning. And we're still following him in his ministry up around the Galilean area, the Sea of Galilee. And remember that when we read about the events that took place in his earthly ministry in the northern part of Israel in the area of Galilee, not always, but most of the readings that we will have in those times will be from the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. When we follow him in his earthly ministry back down around Jerusalem and the area of Judea, we'll see more of the accounts given to us from John in his gospel. So this morning, we're still going to be up in the Galilean area, and our reading will be in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And these particular events that we look at will be recorded in all three of those Gospels. Matthew chapter 9, beginning at verse 9 through verse 13. We're going to see the calling of Matthew to become one of Jesus' disciples. And later on, he'll be selected as one that will be one of the 12 apostles. I'll begin reading at Matthew chapter 9, and then we'll go to Mark and then to the Gospel of Luke. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. As Jesus passed out from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened, as Jesus sat at the table in the house, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So there's Matthew's account of the calling of Matthew to be his disciple, and uh, the evening meal that ended up being a feast at Matthew's house. Now we'll read from the Gospel of Mark and see his account, and it will be in Mark chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Then he went out again by the sea, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, Follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and the sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners. When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so now we turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 5, and we will see Luke's account of uh, this event. After these things, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, Follow me. So he left all, rose up, and followed him. Then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house, and there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them, and their scribes and the Pharisees complained against his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? 
Jesus answered and said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So here are the three gospel accounts of the calling of Matthew, or Levi, and the evening feast or meal that they had at Levi or Matthew's house. What we want to remember that not always, but the majority of the time when Jesus' ministry is in the Galilean area, our reading will come from the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we'll finish up our study of Jesus' earthly ministry in the Galilean area, at least in this particular cycle. He'll come back there before his earthly ministry is over again. But next week, we'll follow him in his ministry when it goes down to the Judean area around Jerusalem, when he'll go back to observe the Feast of Passover. But today, we're going to finish up our study of his northern Galilean ministry in this portion of his earthly ministry. You may have noticed when we read these three accounts that in Matthew's gospel account, uh, he referred to himself as Matthew. In Mark and Luke's gospel accounts, he's referred to as Levi. Bible scholars tell us that Levi was his name before he became a disciple. And we read that Jesus dined at a great feast in Matthew's house that night. <clears throat> if you have happened to have seen the first year's episodes of The Chosen, one of those particular episodes uh, involved Jesus calling Matthew to follow him. And when he left the tax office and followed him, and Jesus told him, uh, tonight we're going to have a great feast. And if you may recall, it was kind of a humorous moment when Matthew said, I don't think you understand. Uh, I'm not very well received among Jewish people because I'm a tax collector. And then Jesus said something along the lines, uh, well, you don't understand. <laughs> You're the one that's going to give this feast. We're going to eat at your house tonight. And so they did have a great feast at Matthew's house. And he had lots of his uh, cohorts, other tax collectors, uh, was there also. And, of course, the scribes and the Pharisees also showed up. They seemed to always show up following Jesus, trying to trap him in something he said or did that they could point at and say that he was breaking some of their laws. But Matthew had lots of tax collectors there. And the scribes and the Pharisees were there as well. And they ridiculed Jesus for eating and drinking with the tax collectors and the sinners. And Jesus' great answer to them was, Those who are well have no need of a physician. And he would have been the physician in this situation. And those tax collectors and sinners would have been those that were sick spiritually in need of a physician. So he said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And one of the interesting things that we find as we follow Jesus throughout his earthly ministry is the down and outers, the sinners, the tax collectors, uh, the prostitutes, uh, the all kinds of uh, things that you can imagine that would have been uh, terrible lifestyles and people to be around, according to the scribes and Pharisees, seem to always willingly and eagerly accept Jesus, and uh, the religious leaders didn't. The next event in the chronological uh, Bible that I read uh, talks about some of John the Baptist's disciples coming to ask Jesus about why he and his disciples didn't fast, and why theirs, why they did, and why his didn't. And again, this will be an account that we find in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. So we'll go back to Matthew and read from there first. And it will be in Matthew chapter number 9 and verses 14 through 17. And the subheading in my study Bible says, Jesus is questioned about fasting. Then the disciples of John came to him, and that's John the Baptist. 
the disciples of John came to him saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often? But your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and the tear is made worse. Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. And now we'll read Mark's account of this from Mark chapter 2, verses 18 to 22. The disciples of John and of the Pharisees were fasting. Then they came and said to him, which would be Jesus, Why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away from the old, and the tear is made worse. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts the wineskins, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. And now from Luke's account, Luke chapter 5, verses 33 through 39. Then they said to him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise those of the Pharisees? But yours eat and drink. And he said to them, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast in those days. Then he spoke a parable to them. No one puts a piece of new garment on an old one. Otherwise, the new makes a tear, and also the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. And no one, having drunk old wine, immediately desires new, for he says, the old is better. So these are interesting comparisons of the same event in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There are several things to consider in these passages, some that you might consider to be rabbit trails. <laughs> and by now you know that I like rabbit trails. Uh, we haven't come to the New Testament verses yet that speak about John the Baptist being put to death. And here we're reading that his disciples, the disciples of John the Baptist, are still very active. And even though he's been imprisoned, they remain active in what they've been doing. Fasting was probably more along the lines of the traditions of the Jews or the additions to the law that the Pharisees added than it was from the Mosaic law itself. In fact, the only time I can recall fasting being talked about in the Mosaic law was once a year during the time of the Feast of the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur as we see it on our calendars today. And the rest of the time they were to be joyous feasts. But it was something that the religious leaders held as important, this idea of fasting. And especially they did so for an outward appearance. Remember that Jesus will even talk about fasting later in his earthly ministry. He'll say, when you fast, uh, you basically need to wash your face, put on a happy face, put on clean clothes so that no one knows that you're fasting. And it's kind of like when you pray, don't pray on the street corners where everyone can see you and hear you. But when you pray, go into your closet and your heavenly father who sees and hears in secret 
will answer you and reward you openly. So Jesus was questioned as to why his disciples did not fast, which was also directed at him because we don't have record of Jesus fasting either. Jesus answers portrayed him as the bridegroom and his disciples would be the friends of the bridegroom. In fact, in uh, the account in Luke's gospel, it's referred to as a parable. Fasting was associated with something solemn or heavy or negative or in a time of mourning. And Jesus' answer insinuated that as long as his friends, the friends of the bridegroom were with him, the bridegroom, there was no need for sadness or heaviness. However, he indicated that such a need would arise when they were separated from him, and then they would fast in those days. Jesus spoke a parable about new things and old things, and he used cloth and wine as the examples. You don't patch an old garment with new cloth because when the new cloth shrinks, it will cause a tear in the old cloth, which can't shrink anymore. And so the tear becomes worse, as he mentioned. And you don't put new wine that has not yet been fermented into old wineskins because the old wineskins cannot stretch any further. And when the new wine expands because of fermentation, it causes the old wineskins to tear and the wine will be lost uh, when it ferments and breaks the old wineskins. The old wineskins will tear and both the wineskin and the wine will be lost and ruined. Jesus and his disciples were bringing about a new gospel message that was not to be mixed with the old covenant. That's the relevance of the parable and the old things and the new things. We're not to mix the gospel message with the Mosaic law. The Apostle Paul even taught us and wrote later that the believers in the New Testament church are not under the law, but we're under grace. Also, as the people prefer old wine that has been fermented over the new, that has not yet been fermented, that would be like those people who were accustomed to the Mosaic law and Judaism. And they did not want to drink the new wine that represented a new gospel message, which causes us to think that after 70 AD, when Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was destroyed, that forsaking the Mosaic law at that time might have been a little bit easier than it was during this time of Jesus' earthly ministry and Judaism being in its heyday and the temple still standing. Next week, when we pick up where we've left off, we'll be going to the gospel account of John and look at Jesus healing a man uh, in the Ju Judean area down around Jerusalem when he went back there to observe the feast of Passover. Remember that Jesus was born king of the Jews. He was a Jewish young lad born to a Jewish mother and the Holy Spirit. And he was the prophesied Messiah, the King of the Jews. And he was without sin, which meant that every time that there was a call to observe one of the feasts that was given in the Mosaic Law, he would have done that. And next week, when we read in from the Gospel of John, we'll see him observing the Feast of Passover again down around Jerusalem. And there he'll run into... Uh, confrontations again with the religious leaders when we see that he's going to heal someone again on the Sabbath day and uh, cause all kinds of uh, irritation to those religious leaders. Again, it's almost as if he made a point of healing people and doing miracles on the Sabbath day just to get under their skin. And I guess if you looked at that the right way, that would indicate a wrong motivation or a bad attitude that could be maybe construed as sin and Jesus had no sin. So I'm probably wrong in thinking of that way. But we'll be looking at that next week. And looking ahead, if you're interested in reading through the Bible in a chronological fashion, 
on January 1st is just around the corner. And I always begin reading through the Bible every year on January 1st. And the program that I have of reading through it on a chronological basis is a 320 day program, which means if I start on January 1st and stay up to date with my reading, I'll be finished going through the Bible by the 16th of November. And if you would be interested in uh, reading along at the same uh, particular scriptures and time frame that I do, uh, I would be glad for you to come along in the journey from Genesis to eternity with me each year. And if you'll contact me at reader66 at gmail.com, uh, I'll see that you get the reading material uh, either by a flash drive or through the email or something like that so that you can read along because my plan is that uh, right now, hopefully on Saturdays of each week, I'll have a, a short commentary on uh, Facebook or YouTube for the previous week's reading. So if you're interested in that and you can think about that and pray about it, uh, you contact me and I'll see that you get the reading material somehow. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your word. The truth of your word rings loud and clear. We're thankful and encouraged from reading these various events in the ministry of Jesus from the various gospel accounts. How that Jesus had time and love and compassion for the sinners, those who he referred to as the spiritually sick who needed a physician. And we realize, Father, that prior to our trusting Christ as Savior, we too are sick sinners spiritually in need of a Savior, in need of the great physician. Thank you so much for those who join us online. We ask for your blessings upon them and their families and their homes. Thank you so much for the way that you watch over us and take care of us. In Jesus' name, we thank you and we praise you. Amen. Have a great weekend. Consider going along on the trip from Genesis to eternity next year. First of the year, just around the corner. And if you're interested, contact me at reader66 at gmail.com. Until then, have a great weekend. Lord bless you.